Be Rad podcast is brought to you by MoFo, male optimization formula with organs to boost testosterone. Brad's macadamia masterpiece, mind-blowing nut butter blend now available on Amazon. Bala enzyme, electrolyte and triple enzyme recovery drink mix. Paleo Valley, nutrient-rich ancestral-inspired health products. By Optimizers, performance supplements like magnesium, probiotics, and more. And B-Rad Whey Protein Super Fuel, coming soon. Stay tuned for details. And please visit bradkearns.com to check out my personal selection of favorite products for health, fitness, and peak performance with great discounts for listeners. And here we go with the show. You want to trigger parasympathetic activity in response to return your body to homeostasis and balance. So beyond the skin, there's other inflammatory conditions that can come into um, the picture here too. I did so myself, uh, racing in China, I got a case of Giardia and it takes weeks to recover from, but when it takes years to recover from, uh, that could put you in that category of burnout, really taking apart what should be working gracefully and effectively. Hey listeners, I discovered an awesome new electrolyte and triple enzyme powdered drink that's going to knock your socks off. It's called Bala Enzyme, and it comes in a convenient little pouch of bright orange powder that you pour into water for the ultimate electrolyte and antioxidant drink. It's simple, convenient, and yes, the orange tint comes from a potent serving of turmeric along with a clean and diverse assortment of enzymes and electrolytes and a perfect taste that's not fake or too sweet. Bala was created by husband and wife doctors to help their patients recover from inflammation, improve hydration, speed up recovery, even relieve joint pain, improve digestion, and boost immunity. I love their incredible devotion to product quality. There's a lot of research behind it, and I just sprinkle this packet into ice water, and it's so easy to stay hydrated because you absolutely enjoy the taste of the drink. Get their convenient little packets. They even designed it with the uh, the tear half torn so it's easy to open into the water. I love what they think of. And it comes in three exciting flavors, pineapple, lime, and berry. It's so potent, it might stain your fingers if you get it on your fingers. And yes, that's a good thing for a serving of turmeric that's that potent. It's also sugar-free, zero carb, and promoting of the three R's, rehydrate relieve and revive please visit balaenzyme.com b-a-l-a-e-n-z-y-m-e and of course there's a special deal for b-rad podcast listeners 30 percent off your first order just use the code b-r-a-d-30 at balaenzyme.com it's time to talk more about overtraining this is part two we are going to dive into the many signs and symptoms of preliminary overtraining all the way into full-blown overtraining and burnout. So please listen to part one where we set the stage with a comprehensive discussion about the stress response in the human body, uh, the stimulus perception response, a three-stage way that we Uh, operate and trigger the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis to uh, produce hormones and cause a complex chain reaction of uh, biological changes in the body in response to stimulus from the environment or from our brains. There's all kinds of stimulus that can provoke a stress response. And we also talk about how many wonderful aspects there are of the fight or flight response when it is called upon appropriately to summon peak performance effort that is short in duration and occasional and balanced uh, with appropriate amounts of uh, moderate stressors and rest and recovery relaxation and how we've uh, gone off the rails in modern life because of the chronic nature of many stressors that we face every single day. So here we'd have to pile on everything on that one side of the balance scale, uh, the stressors. So emotional stressors, uh, environmental stressors, uh, pollution, uh, EMFs, hectic modern life, uh, hyperconnectivity, all that kind of thing. And then, of course, also physical stressors when we're talking about a, a athletic training program, a fitness commitment that is exhaustive and depleting rather than nurturing and, and balancing uh, work efforts with uh, recovery efforts. So 
that was kind of part one, taking you all the way through what's going on in the body and the, uh, the end destination of burnout, which is what happens when your body finally uh, gives up and is not able to uh, appropriately deal with chronic stressors as opposed to temporary fight or flight stressors, which the body is highly calibrated and highly tuned to deliver peak performance on demand when you summon the fight or flight response appropriately. So toward the end of the part one show, we discussed this uh, newer terminology called overreaching, and that is the temporary state of heightened uh, functionality that is prompted by a chronic stimulation of the fight or fright response. So you're carrying on, you're doing fine, you're performing well, but at the same time in this temporary state, it's sort of a, um, a uh, path to impending doom if you don't take corrective action, even though you're capable of performing. It's kind of like when you're running on fumes, let's say, for example, in a uh, intense personal crisis that's lasting for days or weeks. Um, you're not hungry, you're not tired, you wake up kind of shaky, but full of energy and alertness, and you're capable of uh, putting in long stints at the hospital or uh, perhaps at the uh, at the office uh, working long hours because there's a, a grand event coming up that you're preparing for, whatever it is. Uh, but in this overreaching phase, um, you're going to have an assortment of symptoms that are uh, indicating that you're on thin ice here. So let's talk about uh, the early stage overtraining symptoms, and then kind of transition into symptoms of full-blown overtraining, burnout, exhaustion. Uh, so starting point is this symptoms of impending doom, overreaching, early stage overtraining. And one of them is heart rate variability, your HRV score. And this has uh, gained great popularity in recent years as a really wonderful window into the functioning, the harmonious functioning of your autonomic nervous system. That is the uh, desired balance between parasympathetic function and sympathetic function. Parasympathetic, often nicknamed rest and digest, and the sympathetic arm often nicknamed fight or flight. So you want these two branches of the autonomic nervous system to be working in harmony, generally speaking, or if you're uh, getting into a sympathetic dominant state, such as a stressful day at the office or a challenging workout, you want to trigger parasympathetic activity in response to return your body to homeostasis and balance. I talk about this concept of positional parasympathetic breathing that Dr. Janine Krauss shared with us on our show. And it's a really great idea that I've implemented uh, devotedly after my most intense workouts. And it simply involves uh, taking a few minutes, even if it's as little as five minutes, to finish your workout, cool down, you got your sweats on, maybe you're still at the track or at the facility, or you've uh, made it home, and then you want to uh, lay flat on the ground, uh, elevate your feet, and engage in some uh, focused diaphragmatic breathing, relaxation breathing. And this will be a trigger to tell your body that, hey, the rough stuff is over. You finished the workout. Congratulations. Now it's time to go into a parasympathetic mode. So just a, a transition phase where you really work on relaxation uh, prompted by uh, intentional breathing. Okay, so the HRV score is a measure of the beat to beat interval between your heart beats. And yes, indeed, the heart beats in not a metronomic fashion, but rather with a slight or significant variation in the beat to beat intervals. We did an entire show on HRV with Rhonda Collier. You can find that in the archives. So I'm not going to detail uh, what HRV is all about, but um, if you notice a uh, a healthy variation in beat to beat intervals. This indicates a well balanced autonomic nervous system function. So you're not under tremendous stress, you're not overstressed, and you have a favorable HRV score. So the greater variation in beat to beat intervals indicates a high HRV score, and the apps and the meters that are out there that you can use 
um, do a arbitrary one through a hundred scale just for the ease of measuring and tracking. And so the higher the HRV score indicates a greater variation in beat to beat intervals. Interestingly, uh, the less variation in beat to beat intervals, the more metronomic that your heart is beating, uh, this indicates that you're under more stress rather than a healthy stress rest balance. And so a low HRV score is indicative of uh, minimal variation in beat to beat intervals. I have a cool app on the app store for iOS for Apple products called Brad Beat HRV. So go check it out if you're on the app store and you can download that onto your smartphone. And then with a, a simple wireless transmitter that most athletes have to, to measure heart rate, or you can purchase one inexpensively, you can get into the HRV game. They also have them on the newest, latest, greatest uh, smart watches, or, or you can um, also with the, the rings and other biofeedback now, uh, can anything that can measure heart rate uh, can help give you uh, HRV score at, at a glance at your fingertips. So with that set up, and I'm mentioning this as number one because so many people respect HRV as a really important thing to track because of course you can't <laughs> subjectively determine the beat to beat intervals of your heart nor measure it against a uh, historic example just by feel. And so you're looking at this number and the number doesn't lie and um, a lower HRV score can be indicative of you being in a heightened uh, stress state but perhaps not even realizing it, not even being that aware. Uh, number two on the list, and these are um, not going to be ranked in any particular order as I go down there, except that these first two are very likely to be the most valuable. And maybe I'd even switch the order with the maximum aerobic function test being number one. So the MAF test, M-A-F, is the uh, measurement of your uh, performance at the aerobic maximum heart rate. So a quick recap of a MAF test is you perform a, uh, a performance test on the same course at the same heart rate and repeat the test over time to determine your improvements in aerobic function. So your maximum aerobic heart rate is 180 minus your age. You take that calculation, let's say I'm 57, that would put my maximum aerobic heart rate at 123 beats per minute. I'm going to head out to the running track and every single time, the same test, running eight laps around the track in my example, and then I will time myself. So I'll start running, I'll look at my watch and try to peg my heart rate at 123. Um, of course, it's going to bounce around a little bit, but if it starts showing 124, 125, 126, I'm going to back off and return that heart rate to the desired level in order to get a uh, accurate test result. And then you look at your watch at the end of eight laps, and if your time's faster than previous times, that indicates an improvement in aerobic function. And if your time's slower, this is a really great indicator that you are in this uh, no man's land of overreaching or are suffering from you know other forms of uh, temporary stress that are suppressing your aerobic competency and your finishing time. So uh, an adverse math test result, uh, an adverse HRV score lower than your historical average or your, your typical baseline range. And again, we don't want to nitpick here, but I'm talking about patterns. So if you have a couple adverse math test results in a row, if you have a string of days where your HRV is in the 60s on that 1 through 100 scale, rather than typically being between 70 and 80, these are good indicators. Even with all other things being uh, seemingly normal or okay. All right, so then we're going to continue down this list. And the next one I'm going to call uh, dysregulated energy during everyday life. So this is that uh, occasions where you go to the gym, you do your morning workout, you feel fine, you head out the door, you run your six miles, whatever your go-to workout is, and everything is okay. Then in the afternoon, you kind of feel uh, foggy, unnaturally fatigued, uh, a deep desire for a nap. Uh, it also can occur uh, upon waking up in the morning. So rather than popping up uh, full of 
energy and alertness. You're dragging ass, but you finally do get up. Maybe you get a cup of coffee into you or something else to um, to try to uh, get the get the um, the engine started. And then you go out and you have a uh, a decent or even a great workout. Uh, but these signs outside of workout where your energy is dysregulated are definitely uh, in the warning signs. Now, um, here's a weird, interesting one. This is a second wind late in the evening. So uh, if we have healthy uh, cortisol function and healthy uh, autonomic nervous system balance, we are predictably going to wind down and start to slow down all manner of biological and cognitive activity as we approach bedtime. In particular, we want that uh, process of dim light melatonin onset, DLMO, to kick into gear and experience a uh, ever-increasing rise of melatonin in the bloodstream as we approach bedtime because that's known as the sleepiness hormone. We're going to see a drop in body temperature, which is also a great trigger for falling asleep and staying asleep. And so all these hormonal processes work beautifully every single day to help us wind down and have that desire for sleep and be uh, adaptable to falling asleep rather than tossing and turning. And if you kick into an extra gear uh, f- perhaps you were uh, returning home from a busy day at 6.30 p.m. and felt really wiped out and you're just blobbing on the couch, you're um, going through digital entertainment, and then um, you get this second wind of energy where you flip open your laptop screen or you're starting to get more and more excited uh, watching the show and choosing to watch another episode Uh, You get on a phone call right before your uh, designated bedtime and it becomes animated and exciting and you're alert and energized. Maybe you're even leashing up the dog for a walk around the block and you find yourself uh, hopping and skipping and feeling a bounce in your step that wasn't there hours before. And this is an indication that your cortisol pattern has become dysregulated. So you will get a spike in cortisol in the late or later evening hours rather than the predictable drop in cortisol and rise in melatonin. So this is, um, it it might feel nice to be able to uh, finish your email inbox late at night, uh, but this is another sign of impending doom and dysregulated hormonal patterns. Uh, Here's number five on the list, and these are slight, ever so slight, immune disturbances and inflammatory disturbances. Um, one of the weird ones for me that's super reliable that I am pushing it a little bit too hard and on the edge is uh, contracting athlete's foot. Hey, I'm telling you like it is, people. So when I get that condition, it is almost always associated or coming on the heels of a high-stress training period. And we can uh, count other things in there, like a slight uh, scratchy throat, stuffy nose, allergies coming up, uh, increased sneezing, uh, or if you have any kind of nagging inflammatory conditions that come and go, skin conditions are very common uh, under this category. And so you get these little flare-ups of this, that, or the other thing. And again, is showing that your immune system has been uh, put on the sidelines for a little bit too long. Uh, As I talked about in episode one, the fundamental um, description of the fight or flight response is that basic metabolic functions are put on hold in favor of emergency operations. So it's kind of like the crew at the fire station having a nice evening meal, playing some cards, doing some leisure reading, uh, heading up to the barracks to go to sleep in the bunk. And then at 2 a.m., the horn sounds and everybody jumps up and kicks into action. And so all those processes uh, that were helping uh, with restoration have been put on hold because of the alarm system sounding in the middle of the night. And that's the nature of uh, the firefighting career. And we do the same to ourselves when we uh, o- overstress ourselves and put basic functions on the sideline. And then accordingly, we're going to pick up uh, slight immune disturbances and inflammatory disturbances. Okay, here's number six. Uh, this would be things like cramping, twitching muscles, and hyper movements such as tapping your feet while you're at rest or grinding your teeth. And these are indications of overstimulation or imbalance in sympathetic function, 
uh, versus the harmonious balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic. So you're not truly relaxed. Your feet are fidgeting and tapping your teeth. uh, Your muscles are twitching even involuntarily. I remember that from uh, extreme swimming workouts. And oftentimes in the hours afterwards, I would feel my deltoids just flickering and I could lift up my shirt sleeve and see the muscle twitching visibly coming out of the skin. Uh, So that brings us to uh, number seven, and that is uh, skin problems. The skin is really, really sensitive to stress and anything of a uh, breakout rash, uh, especially recurring conditions that come and go are directly associated with uh, a bit of suppressed immune function or uh, difficulty uh, controlling inflammation. Um, So beyond the skin, there's other inflammatory conditions that can come into um, the picture here too. That's pretty related to number five, but we'll give it its own skin problems. Number seven. Number eight, frequent urination, especially at nighttime. Oh, what's the big deal getting up and uh, going to the bathroom at night? Guess what? Uh, We should be just as good as our canine friends at holding it in uh, for an eight-hour period of sleep and not having to get up to desperately empty your bladder because it's completely full. It is definitely not full, and that's not the reason that you've been awakened. It's more likely uh, an inappropriate stimulation of the adrenal glands uh, causing the kidneys to uh, activate and give you the, uh, the, the urge to urinate. Uh, in Latin, adrenal, ad renal, means next to kidney. And that's where the adrenal glands reside, uh, right next to the kidney. And so when the adrenals are overactivated due to, again, a uh, imbalance in um, autonomic nervous system function brought about by excessive o- overstimulation of the sympathetic fight or flight arm, that's when you have this frequent urge to urinate, uh, especially at night. And I can relate to this when it's directly associated with uh, jet travel, which is highly stressful and uh, prompts a lot of adrenal stimulation. Typically that first night in the new environment, uh, I find myself getting up more than once, sometimes twice, three times, and that's just trying to unwind from the stressful jet travel. So pay attention and note that that's um, uh, not normal. Dr. Phil Maffetone says this is definitely a bad deal that need to get up and urinate at night. Uh, I've heard other experts like Dr. Huberman say that it's no big deal and you should be able to just go right back to sleep. Um, But I'm thinking hard about that because it definitely seems to be correlated with uh, overly stressful periods. Uh, Number nine, speaking of uh, the plumbing, um, decreased libido and erectile dysfunction. And again, remember, this whole list is uh, contemplated in the possibility that you are still performing well in workouts. So when you're in this overreaching state and the typical biological functions are put on hold, that can include uh, sexual function, reproductive function, which is uh, the human's most prized uh, resource. It's our primary biological drive to reproduce besides to uh, drink, eat, and sleep. But when we are placing ourselves or experiencing a chronically overly stressful period of life, that is not a good time to reproduce. Thereby, the body puts these uh, functions and drives on hold. So I said number nine, uh, lack of libido, erectile dysfunction for the male. And then number 10 would be amenorrhea. That's the cessation of menstruation that is very common in uh, female athletes who have low body fat. So the endurance running community and other female elite performers whose quest for peak performance uh, has uh, prompted them to uh, drop body fat way down into the range that is not optimal for reproduction. And uh, carrying body fat is essential for uh, fertility, childbirth, nursing, all that great stuff, but it's not essential to uh, make the Olympic team uh, break world records and so forth. And so it's extremely common that the elite female athlete is trading in Um, her reproductive fitness for uh, marginal increases in performance, right? If you're going to race the marathon or the Hawaii Ironman, you're looking at the the top 10 list uh, of females and they all are going to have extremely low body fat. Same with the CrossFit games or anything that's, you know, at the highest level. Interestingly, in contrast, 
low body fat in the male is correlated with reproductive fitness in general, but when the overtraining patterns are present, uh, like I just described, um, low libido is their marker rather than low body fat. So encompassing uh, several of the aforementioned, let's remember Dr. Herman Ponser's quote that locomotion, repair, growth, and reproduction are a zero-sum game. Uh, What that means is if you overload uh, uh, with locomotion, locomotion meaning all forms of exercise, physical work, you are going to uh, compromise or borrow from the others. Repair processes like your immune function, growth, that would be like recovery when you're in the overtraining pattern to recovery is going to suffer, and also uh, your reproductive fitness. Okay, so that takes us to uh, number 11, which would be insomnia. And boy, if you're training hard and working harder than usual, why wouldn't you be crashed out and sleeping better than, uh, better than ever? And in many cases, if your uh, exercise program is appropriate, it's going to facilitate uh, good sleep, maybe, maybe deeper sleep than normal because you do need that extra rest. And I definitely associate my uh, increased exercise output with needing more sleep that very night following a a, a tough sprint workout, jumping session, whatever. Um, However, if you expand that into the big picture of performing strenuous workouts too frequently, you are going to flip the coin over to the insomnia side again because you are too riled up with a chronic uh, overstimulation of the fight or flight response and the sympathetic is dominating over the parasympathetic, uh, preventing you, inhibiting you from getting into that rest and digest mode. And that brings us to number 12, which are dietary irregularities, including um, digestive disturbances, uh, increase or unusual gas bloating, uh, digestive pain, or irregularities with your elimination patterns. And again, it's uh, putting digestion on hold Uh, in favor of fight or flight opportunities. Uh, Some other types of dietary irregularities are cravings for sugar, and this would be to to feed the beast because you become carbohydrate dependent because your workouts are too stressful. And for endurance people, that would often indicate uh, exceeding that maximum aerobic heart rate too frequently, and therefore uh, prioritizing glucose burning rather than uh, prioritizing fat burning for most of their workouts, but for all manner of athletes, the the overtraining or the overreaching pattern is a chronic um, uh, depletion of muscle and liver glycogen, uh, thereby the need to reload and thereby the triggering of the appetite hormones to uh, overconsume food and especially crave sugar uh, because you're uh, depleting, refilling, depleting, refilling. So it's that carbohydrate dependency pattern. Um, also in this uh, list of dietary irregularities would be binge eating. And, and then on the flip side, uh, a lack of appetite And this might be from those um, true uh, sustained family or personal crises where you're uh, running on fumes and you are engaging the process of gluconeogenesis uh, to the extreme such that even your appetite is suppressed. Uh, I know it's kind of confusing to think, hey, binge eating and sugar cravings as well as a lack of appetite but we can uh, kind of blanket this into um, dysregulated appetite and eating patterns prompted by overreaching. Okay, that brings us to 13, and the last one on the list of overreaching, impending doom, would be mood disturbances. So you're irritable, you're cranky, you're impatient, more than usual, right? You're uh, driving in the usual rush hour traffic, but you're complaining about it more and using your horn more, whatever. Uh, And of course, that fight or flight Uh, existence is not aligned with a uh, calm, patient, uh, personal disposition. And so, again, we all have some baseline. Maybe you're a cranky person all the time, (laughs) or you're like Larry David on Curb Your Enthusiasm, whatever, but it's noticing uh, kind of differences or hearing about it from people close to you. Uh, What's bugging you these days? Nothing. I'm fine. I had a great workout this morning. (laughs) Okay. Signs of impending doom. Then what happens, as I described in more detail on the first show, 
is that your your brain, your body, the fight or flight response is working hard, uh, a valiant effort to keep up with the demand being placed on it, the stimulus that you're placing upon it day after day after day. So you're pumping out cortisol, you're engaging the graceful process of gluconeogenesis, that's the conversion of amino acids, often from lean muscle mass into a uh, readily available energy source of glucose. Uh, all these things that are uh, borrowing or putting basic biological function on hold. And then the body says enough already and the fight or flight response becomes exhausted. And that's when burnout occurs and the wheels fall off. And instead of uh, performing uh, good or even superior uh, workout performance, of course, your workout performance suffers royally and so does your performance in every way in everyday life. And so let's just go through 12 pretty obvious symptoms of burnout. And number one would be waking up feeling trashed, like you just slept for however many hours and you wake up and you're exhausted. Boy, uh, something is wrong with that picture. And that sometimes takes many weeks, maybe even many months, maybe even years to turn things around and regain that natural baseline of energy and alertness that we should expect to experience every single day of our lives. Uh, but it's a tough one when the wheels fall off and the stories and the the internet articles that I reference so frequently that my mom, the, the link generator, has them uh, memorized and can cut and paste. So uh, I, I really strongly urge you to read uh, some of these uh, comprehensive takes on the overtraining patterns uh, particularly in the endurance community. Uh, one article is called One Running Shoe in the Grave, and the other article is called Running on Empty. And it talks about elite performers that uh, vanished from uh, the competitive scene quickly because they experienced burnout. Okay, so um, number one is just waking up feeling like crap and wondering how long is this going to last? And the answer is it could last a really long time if you're not careful and don't take a dramatic corrective action uh, once you've uh, entered the uh, stage, the the major stage of overtraining burnout. Number two is uh, poor workout performance. So um, if you're in the mild uh, category of overtraining burnout, you can still go out there. You can still put the the miles in. You head to the gym. You still do the CrossFit session or the personal training session, but your performance is uh, significantly uh, below your typical expectation, and especially running out of gas near the end of the workout. And so you do okay for uh, the first 30 minutes of the group exercise cycling class, and then you just your legs start to feel like lead uh, from 30 minutes to 45 minutes. So running out of energy and generally poor workout performance, definitely on the list. Uh, number three would be uh, soreness and joint problems that persist. So uh, getting an overuse injury could even be categorized as part of the uh, part of the overtraining process, uh, but it's also um, brought about by you know poor technique, um, maybe uh, a mild uh, errors in the training patterns and the stress load that's not putting you into true burnout, but it's definitely messing with your left Achilles tendon, that kind of thing. But when you have this persistent muscle soreness that takes longer than usual to go away or joint difficulties that are uh, worse than historical norm, that's when you're looking at burnout conditions. And uh, one of the other uh, prominent stress hormones is called aldosterone. So there's cortisol and there's also aldosterone. Aldosterone uh, plays a big role in your uh, sodium balance, regulating sodium balance, and also in keeping your joints uh, lubricated and supple and performing well. So when you have this persistent soreness and joint trouble, uh, that could be uh, a sign of uh, insufficient aldosterone. Interesting nuance that I can validate from personal experience. This is especially so with joint pain in the lower back or on the inside of the knee. For whatever reason, I guess these are particularly sensitive areas, uh, but that's the, uh, the, the burnout symptom. Uh, number four would be a trashing of the digestive system. So we mentioned that in the overreaching symptoms that you're having these um, perhaps mild digestive irregularities, uh, but the digestive system is so sensitive to stress 
and it is often uh, deemed or believed to be the first thing to go. I remember when I was uh, in the triathlon scene with many other hard training athletes, all of us battling on that fine line to try and avoid overtraining and get those incremental improvements in performance, and there was a lot of complaints about digestive function because Again, if you think about the uh, the stress response and putting basic biological functions on hold, uh, nothing more so than digestion. And of course, parasympathetic nickname, rest and digest, uh, indicates just how uh, important it is to be in stress-rest balance in order to uh, achieve, facilitate optimal digestive function. Uh, and so this trashing of the digestive system uh, would come in the form of uh, gas, bloating, cramps, pain, uh, problems with the elimination, sustained problems with elimination, right? So uh, maybe one day you have uh, diarrhea or, or some symptom, it's fine the next day. But if you're uh, dealing with this stuff for a week or you're going into deeper digestive problems, um, I remember um, the great triathlete Mike Pig battled Giardia for a couple of years. So his digestive system wasn't right because he picked up an infection uh, swimming in some dirty lake somewhere across the globe. I did so myself uh, racing in China. I got a case of Giardia and it takes weeks to recover from. But when it takes years to recover from, uh, that could put you in that category of, uh, you know, b- burnout, uh, really taking apart what um, should be working Uh, gracefully and effectively. And of course, leaky gut syndrome is strongly associated with overtraining. um, And that would be uh, coming in the form of a chronic inflammation of the, uh, the gut lining. And that's what causes damage to the very delicate microvilli, the little filters and fingers that stick around and wiggle and uh, filter out the things that are not supposed to be entering into the bloodstream. Uh, but this leaky gut can also happen when you uh, heat up the digestive tract, as would happen when you're exercising uh, for long periods of time. And so when you're out there on a five-hour bike ride in the heat, um, due to the need to dissipate heat and also to manage uh, onboarding of more calories while you're exercising, the digestive tract is taking a beating uh, because basically it becomes leaky during the during the effort because of the elevation in body temperature uh, throughout the body, including the digestive tract. You're heated up, you're inflamed, and you're trying to throw down energy drills and, and sweetened drinks and whatever else you need to make it through the workout. So um, that is a uh, an assault to the normal healthy function of the digestive tract. And if you're doing it day after day after day, Oh boy, that's a big uh, fat position there on the overtraining burnout list. Number five is a decline in hand-eye coordination, uh, a decline in technique and precision in performing the desired activities. Uh, This could be both during your exercise and in other areas of life, uh, making mistakes, just uh, kind of a, a fatiguing of the central nervous system due to excessive stress patterns. And then uh, accordant burnout, of course, has a strong influence on your cognitive function. Uh, Interestingly, uh, on this category, uh, there's an app that you can get called CNS TAP Test. That stands for Central Nervous System. The CNS TAP Test app. So you can download that, put it on your smartphone, and it basically asks you to, when, when it's time to go, uh, you tap the screen as fast as you can, and I believe the test lasts for around 10 seconds. So it's like, how many taps can you get in 10 seconds? And it's really hard, and it's fun, because if you tense up, uh, you'll go slower. So you have to find this sweet spot where you're in the groove, and your fingers just tapping really gracefully. You're not trying too hard. You're not tapping the screen too hard. And then you get your total and you establish a uh, a baseline number. So maybe you're in the uh, mid to high 70s. And if you are significantly below that, that's a sign of central nervous system fatigue that you can perform at your fingertips. Ha ha ha. Okay. Number six. Um, this would be also a repeat of uh, poor immune function, immune trouble. And so this category includes uh, frequent colds, 
uh, a flaring up of things like allergies, asthma, and of course, uh, contracting major illnesses. And boy, that's when we start to get into um, some deep concerns as these things kind of linger along, or you get strange, unfamiliar illnesses that evade uh, traditional medical treatment. Uh, that's some of the storylines from the articles that I mentioned. I just heard a disturbing stat from Dr. Tommy Wood, frequent podcast guest, and we didn't talk about this in our recently published show, but um, the population of extreme athletes, especially endurance athletes, triathletes, marathon runners, ultra marathoners, are getting a preponderance of long COVID. Uh, so contracting COVID and having symptoms linger on for uh, weeks, months on end, you might have heard of some of these like the loss of smell and taste, uh, problems with lung function. And so it's striking this population uh, with uh, unusual frequency. Um, and they don't know why, but uh, they surmise that the chronic suppression of the immune system uh, leaves this seemingly healthy fit population more vulnerable to COVID than the average person walking their dog around the block. Whew, ouch, be careful. Uh, number seven on the list is uh, difficulties with thermoregulation. So uh, maybe you're colder than usual when you're sitting on the couch at night, you need to wrap up in a blanket. Maybe you're having difficulty uh, remaining uh, stable and you feel hot uh, more than usual in whatever environment. And so difficulty regulating body temperatures on the list. Uh, number eight, here's another nuance one that I only recently became acquainted with thanks to the uh, HRV work of Joel Jameson, uh, the MMA trainer, eightweeksout.com. We had an interview several years ago. It's a great interview in the archive. So please uh, download that if you want to hear about the importance of recovery-based training programs and many other topics that Joel's a leader on. But he's also a true pioneer in HRV. He's been using it for decades. And he proclaims that not only an unusually low pattern of HRV readings, but also a pattern of unusually high HRV readings. And this is interesting because it's widely dispensed that a high HRV is good and a low HRV is bad. It means you're tired. It means your heart's beating metronomically. But if your HRV is elevated above your normal baseline range, it could be an indicator of parasympathetic dominance because you are so fried that the parasympathetic is stepping up to center stage. Your sympathetic nervous system is bombed out from a chronic uh, stress and overtraining burnout pattern. Therefore, you are seeing a greater variation in beat-to-beat -beat intervals than normal balance. So we always want to speak in terms of balance when it comes to stress-rest balance. We don't want to be uh, just you know relaxed on the couch at all times, uh, waking hours uh, away from what we absolutely have to do in order to uh, be a healthy person. So uh, a little bit of stress is good. That is the term you stress that I talked about in the first show from uh, the great leader in this uh, research, Dr. Hans Selye, from uh, decades ago, maybe a century ago, when he first started uh, presenting groundbreaking work on the stress response, won the Nobel Prize accordingly. Uh, but this concept of you stress is how we want to optimally uh, navigate through life and do great things and take on challenges and uh, feel that sense of satisfaction and purpose, uh, but not overdo it. So unusually low pattern of HRV readings or an unusually high streak of HRV readings could both be indication uh, that something's off. Okay, number nine, we have low blood pressure. Of course, you can determine this if you are a frequent blood pressure tester, and you can also determine it if you experience dizziness upon standing up. And this is a uh, common symptom among highly trained athletes uh, that have that e extremely uh, highly calibrated cardiovascular system. Um, and so it's something to manage, but when it becomes uh, significant and you really get that uh, woozy feeling when you stand up, it could be an indication of um, overtraining, burnout, uh, and low blood pressure. Also, um, messing up your electrolyte balance. So you have uh, low sodium uh, electrolyte disturbances, which you could be uh, finding out from, from blood tests. 
but also uh, there's other symptoms of, of practical symptoms of electrolyte depletion, mineral depletion, low sodium. One of them is this low blood pressure and other ones are uh, frequent cramping and things of that nature. So um, then we get to number 10 and this would be excessive sleep uh, beyond your normal pattern. Okay. So I've bragged many times on the show about my stint on the professional triathlon circuit where I was asleep for half of my, uh, half of my life for the duration of my career. So I slept reliably 10 hours every night and I needed a two hour nap every afternoon. And that was my, that was my daily routine that enabled me to get the most out of my body and recover optimally and perform, you know, and, and put in this many hours of training that was necessary uh, to excel in triathlon. Uh, guess what? In the off season, when I was really fried and tired from all the traveling, uh, I would often sleep every night for 12 hours. I'm talking like 10 to 10 or 1030 to 1030, which is so ridiculous to think about now. I don't know, maybe uh, when we were uh, one, two, and three years old, we all slept for 12 hours, right? But it, it still feels like, wow, what a waste of what a waste of a day to be asleep for half of it. But I absolutely needed it because I was uh, necessarily recovering from uh, the extremely stressful pattern of racing on the circuit, traveling, putting in uh, 15 to 25 races a year. And so this would last for maybe a month or six weeks. And it was a little disturbing, uh, but in reflection, uh, it was a necessary uh, going hand in hand with the extreme stress of the training and traveling. And believe me, it, a, a lot of times, uh, the only reason I got out of bed was because it was 1030. And I was like, disgusted, like, all right, man, come on, you've had enough. But I really I had an incredibly increased need for sleep uh, due to the bottoming out of all that, um, the, the, those high stress phases of the season. Okay, so that takes us to number 11, and this is simply that um, lack of joy and lack of desire to train and could be um, the most sensible and reliable indicator of them all, that what was giving you joy and satisfaction and uh, alertness and energy and a bounce in your step is now um, not even something you want to contemplate. And that's when you know that you're in the deep throes of burnout. So hopefully we can take corrective action well before uh, we get into that uh, a state of ennui about the thing that was, you know, the centerpiece of our life before. And then finally, number 12, um, all the mood disturbances, the psychological aspects of overtraining and burnout. So you could talk about uh, poor cognitive function, inability to concentrate, depression, apathy, malaise, moodiness, withdrawing socially. And these are all ways for the uh, that the brain and body try to conserve energy and kind of rebalance and recover from a chronic or a prolonged period of overly stressful existence. We're just trying to uh, narrow our scope, uh, minimize our activities, minimize our emotions. Uh, it's no fun, but it's probably a necessary balance that you just have to tone things down and wind things down for a while until you start to regain uh, that natural joy and that natural inspiration for going out there and training. So that package, people, is the uh, uh, comprehensive symptoms of uh, overreaching and then uh, another set of symptoms for overtraining and burnout. And that'll take us to a part three show of how to recover and how to uh, appropriately return to exercise and hopefully one day uh, back into training and picking up where you left off. But you have to be very, very careful and deliberate and maybe reset all your parameters uh, in order to not be one of these victims uh, of burnout where uh, the person never returns to their previous level of engagement. Um, so a quick, quick summary of the symptoms, and then I will send you off and encourage you to listen to part three. Uh, so the symptoms of impending doom or overreaching, uh, uh, HRV that's lower than normal, uh, a slower than normal math test result. Uh, number three, energy dysregulated during daily life. So it's tough to wake up, but you go put in a good workout. Uh, number four is that second wind in the evening, uh, in the late evening, and that would be uh, signs of dysregulated cortisol production. Number five are the slight immune disturbances and inflammatory conditions. I mentioned athlete's foot is my reliable marker. Number six is this uh, hyperactivity 
uh, is things like cramping, twitching, uh, tapping your feet, grinding your teeth. Number seven is all manner of skin problems, which are so closely tied to uh, if difficulty regulating inflammation appropriately. Number seven is frequent urination, especially at night. Uh, adrenal next to renal. That's your Latin lesson for the day. Number nine is uh, lack, uh, decline in libido, erectile dysfunction. Uh, the body is diverting resources uh, to emergency situation rather than the basic biological drives like reproduction. And number 10 for females, amenorrhea. Again, diversion of the resources. Ponser's quote, locomotion, repair, growth, and reproduction are a zero-sum game. Number 11 is insomnia. That's that sympathetic balance and the difficulty winding down and turning on parasympathetic to get a good night's sleep. Number 12 is dietary irregularities, so cravings for sugar because you're in that sugar-dependent training pattern, binge eating, and on the flip side, lack of appetite because you are kicking into this gluconeogenesis during these sustained uh, periods of overstress. That might be family or personal crisis or overtraining. And then number 13, mood disturbances. So you feel uh, more irritable, cranky, and impatient than your usual irritable, cranky, and impatient self. (laughs) Okay, then we transition to uh, the 12 symptoms of true burnout and overtraining. And number one would be waking up feeling trashed even after many hours of sleep. Number two would be uh, crappy workout performances, especially running out of gas near the end. Number three, persistent soreness and joint trouble, uh, especially experiencing joint pain in the lower back or on the inside of the knee due to insufficient aldosterone levels, a prominent stress hormone. Number four would be the major digestive system troubles, uh, digestive system being the first to go in many cases. And so this is all kinds of Uh, gas, bloating, cramps, digestive pain, elimination and irregularities, and symptoms of leaky gut syndrome. Number five is uh, central nervous system decline, cognitive decline. So you have poor hand-eye coordination. Your technique is faltering. uh, You're making mistakes, general mistakes, and absent-mindedness in everyday life. So go get that app, CNS Tap Test, and have some fun. Number six is immune trouble uh, from the minor stuff like increased colds, increased severity of colds, uh, allergies, asthma, and then the major illnesses like the long COVID that uh, the endurance athletes are seem to be suffering from. Number seven is thermoregulatory trouble. So you're a little too hot, you're a little too cold, more so than normal, regulating and feeling comfortable. Number eight is a pattern of not only unusually low HRV, as we talked about in uh, the overreaching symptoms, but a pattern of unusually high HRV scores uh, suggesting uh, parasympathetic domination because you are so fried that your sympathetic nervous system isn't responding appropriately. Number nine is low blood pressure as evidenced by dizziness upon standing up and related to electrolyte imbalances and depletion, especially low sodium. Number 10 is excessive sleep. So your historical pattern, your comfortable amount of sleep, um, notwithstanding sleeping a little more after tough workouts, like I mentioned, but just being uh, deep into the persistent need for more hours of sleep than usual, like Brad in the off season going for the big 12-er and then uh, having to struggle out of bed even then. Uh, Number 11, a lack of joy or desire to train. Oh boy, that's uh, not what we signed up for when we first put on our running shoes or walked into the gym or joined the team. Okay, number 12 is the psychological mood disturbances. So difficulty concentrating, depression, apathy, malaise, moodiness, withdrawing socially, just trying to shut things down so you can rebuild your energy. And that is a summary. Let's stay away from this stuff and learn more practical tips in the next show in order to never go near. Thank you so much for listening to this important topic. Please honor and respect these symptoms. I had so much unregulated competitive intensity in my youth and even lingering today because I enjoy the challenges so much that I will still uh, make the mistake and tiptoe into these overtraining patterns and experience uh, persistent muscle soreness that should be gone. But if because I've layered uh, a hard workout onto another hard workout when I wasn't truly ready and recovered, and boy, uh, it's so much easier to kind of err on the conservative side and continue to progress and enjoy your experience rather than have to suffer. Thanks for listening. 
Talk to you soon. I want to talk about the best magnesium supplement from Bioptimizers. Did you know that magnesium is believed to be one of the most widely deficient micronutrients, that it's involved in 600 different enzyme reactions in the body, and that 75% of modern citizens fail to get enough from their diets? This is due to depleted soil, missing the truly magnesium-rich foods, and stressful lifestyle patterns depleting magnesium levels. It's definitely one of the most important supplements, and Bioptimizers has a sensational product called Magnesium Breakthrough, the only organic full-spectrum magnesium supplement that includes seven unique forms of magnesium for stress relief and better sleep. Visit magbreakthrough.com slash brad and you get an incredibly informative page on how the product will benefit you and the best ways to use it. You'll also save 10% on that page or by using the code brad10 at checkout. Try the product with a full money-back guarantee from Buy Optimizers. Visit magbreakthrough, M-A-G, breakthrough.com slash brad or use the code brad10 at checkout. Thank you for listening to the show. I love sharing the experience with you and greatly appreciate your support. Please email podcast at bradventures.com with feedback, suggestions, and questions for the Q&A shows. Subscribe to our email list at bradkearns.com for a weekly blast about the published episodes and a wonderful bi-monthly newsletter edition with informative articles and practical tips for all aspects of healthy living. You can also download several awesome free ebooks when you subscribe to the email list. And if you could go to the trouble to leave a five or five star review with Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen to the shows, that would be super incredibly awesome. It helps raise the profile of the BRAD podcast and attract new listeners. And did you know that you can share a show with a friend or loved one by just hitting a few buttons in your player and firing off a text message? My awesome podcast player called Overcast allows you to actually record a soundbite excerpt from the episode you're listening to and fire it off with a quick text message. Thank you so much for spreading the word. And remember, be rad.